Hi, and thank you for watching the 10th installment of God's Roadmap to the End. Today we continue our study of the Rapture and I'm very excited about this video as it contains information that I guarantee many of you have never seen or heard before and I give all the glory to our Heavenly Father for revealing this to us. I also pray that our Heavenly Father will use this information to further His Kingdom and to bring Him glory and to increase His harvest and to upset the enemy. I hope you will find this video as exciting and as fascinating as I have in discovering the information shared within it. Our study gets a little more technical today and we will delve into understanding how various pieces of God's Word fit together, like the clockwork of a watch, as we study some aspects that I believe will give more insight into what is meant by the first resurrection. This is described to us in Revelation 20. I will also show you how applying patterns to the information given to us in the Word of God opens up a new level of understanding. Today's study will be a lengthy one, as there are so many aspects to consider, but I'm sure that it will not only be interesting, but also eye-opening and worth your time. Many of the aspects that are contained in the video were only revealed to me as I was working on the script. If you haven't seen part 1 of the Rapture series or the videos on Daniel's 70th week, I would recommend that you do as these provide important foundational background to understand the timeline involved. Without understanding the timeline correctly, the information provided in today's study may be confusing. In part 1 of the Rapture series, we looked at the authority of the Church and how the Church is clearly identified as the restraining force mentioned by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Having received the keys of the Kingdom of God and being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Today we look specifically at an event mentioned in Revelation 20, known as the First Resurrection, and how the two witnesses ministry, as described in Revelation, plays a role in helping us to understand what is meant by this. So let us dive right in and continue our study. This is what we read in Revelation 20 regarding the first resurrection. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and a judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. When I read this passage, I immediately have to stop and ask a question. How do we interpret what is meant by the first resurrection in Revelation 20 to avoid the contradiction we face in light of the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, as seen in Matthew 27? The resurrection and ascension of Jesus and the Old Testament saints match all the characteristics of the resurrection and ascension of the two witnesses, occurring in the same time frame as those who are beheaded for refusing the mark of the beast, and yet the latter is called the first resurrection. We read the following about Jesus' resurrection. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. How can Revelation 20 describe the resurrection of those who refuse to accept the mark of the beast as being the first resurrection, if the Bible clearly shows us that the resurrection of Jesus and the saints that rose with him from the dead was the first? Fortunately, the Bible supplies us with very clear answers regarding this question, if we know where to look. This is why I find the Word of God so amazing. If we don't apply Isaiah 28 verse 10 to the subject, this information remains hidden. We can only obtain a clear understanding when we expect various passages in this amazing book to provide partial detail on subjects that we study. I believe that failing to understand that the information in the Word of God is divided 
and requires us to rightly assemble this, just as one would put a puzzle together, has led to the many different seemingly valid interpretations of scripture and this has resulted in the endless arguments between believers who fight over two pieces of the same puzzle that should only be considered when combined. In order to understand what Revelation 20 is conveying to us when it mentions the first resurrection, we have to use 1 Corinthians 15 as a key to unlock this mystery. This is what we read. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. This passage in Paul's letter to the Corinthians explains that there is an order that is associated with people that are resurrected from the dead. Notice how Paul describes Jesus' resurrection from the dead as being the first fruits of this order and of them that have died. This is a very important aspect that Paul mentions and a clear indication of the model or pattern that we should apply to understand this correctly. And this model then is the harvests of Israel. We know that there are several crops mentioned in the word of God but they are all harvested according to a specific pattern or methodology that Israel was instructed to apply when harvesting a field. We see this instruction then given to Israel in the following two passages. The first of the firstfruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. When a field of any kind of crop is harvested in Israel, this process consists of bringing the first fruits of the harvest into the house of God. And this is then followed by the main harvest when the remainder of the crop has ripened. When the owner of the field harvests his crop, he has to leave the corners of the field to the poor. And this final part, according to God's instructions, may not be harvested by the owner of the field. This pattern conveys to us that there are then three distinct parts to a harvest as described in the word of God. Given that Jesus is described as being the first fruits of those that have slept, we should then expect two additional parts or resurrection events if we follow the same pattern and these two remaining events would then be associated firstly with the main harvest and secondly with the corners of the field that are left to the poor. If we look at this on a timeline, we have planting of the harvest to start off with, the harvest will then grow and ripen and when the first fruits of the crop begin to reach maturity, the owner gathers a small section of the field having the first ripe fruits or grain and takes this to the temple of God. After this point, he waits until the entire field ripens and then harvests the majority of the crop, making sure that he leaves the corners of the field to the poor. These remain until they are picked off by the poor, leaving the field empty again. Another aspect we have to consider is that the first fruits are holy unto the Lord. They sanctify the rest of the harvest, even the corners of the field that are left to the poor. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. We will discover more about this attribute as we continue. If we now look at what Revelation 20 describes concerning the first resurrection, we understand by considering the model that is given to us in the association of Jesus' resurrection as being the first fruits, that the first resurrection consists of three parts. We should therefore search the word of God for three parts that describe the order of events associated with the first resurrection and modeled after the harvest methodology given to Israel. We already know that Jesus' resurrection with the Old Testament saints 
represents the first part of this harvest, and based on the concluding remarks in Revelation 20, we know that the harvest, or three-part resurrection, concludes at the point where those who have been beheaded for refusing to worship the beast are resurrected. When we understand the order of events associated with a harvest as instructed by our Heavenly Father, we realize that when Jesus calls this the first resurrection, that there are most likely additional harvests that will follow, applying the same harvesting methodology. We should then expect at least a second resurrection that would follow after the first resurrection, and this is hinted at in the following passage. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. It is clear that there will be a second resurrection based on the statement given in the first verse of this passage. This gives us further insight into how the crops mentioned in the word of God provide us with models for different groups that will be resurrected at different times, as well as the order in which this will happen. There is also another passage that alludes to this, and we read this in John chapter 10. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Before we look deeper into this, let us first apply the knowledge gained up to this point to better understand what is meant with the first resurrection. Once again, when we study the Bible, it is important to keep in mind that our Heavenly Father has designed His Word in such a manner that it only supplies us with a portion of information in each passage that relates to a specific subject. The next step in our discovery would be to search the Bible for passages that describe resurrection events modeled after the harvest methodology. Once we have found these, we can evaluate them and see how they compare to the harvest model that we have been referred to in 1 Corinthians 15, where Jesus' resurrection and ascension are modeled after the first fruits of a harvest. So what is the first resurrection and how should we understand this? The fact that God's word gives us a template to use when considering Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension, and associates this with a three-part process, enables us to evaluate potential events recorded in the Bible against what we know, to see if they match the template and fit into the model. There are a number of instances recorded in the Word of God where people were raised from the dead, but most of these involved other people that raised them from the dead. These happened before and also after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. But what are the differences and why is Jesus' resurrection called the first fruits of the first resurrection? There are at least four aspects that I can identify in which Jesus' resurrection is uniquely different from other historic resurrections that are described in the Bible. Firstly, Jesus was raised from the dead through an act of God without involving another living person. Secondly, this is the first collective resurrection event in which not only Jesus, but also some of the Old Testament saints were resurrected, and in which the event is being associated with a harvest activity. This is also one instance in which the Bible provides us with very little information regarding those that rose with Jesus, in the first passage that mentions them as seen in Matthew 27. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. The fact that this is the only information given to us about them at this point, often results in overlooking or forgetting this very important aspect of the first fruits resurrection. I will show you how the Word of God provides us with much more detail about these people when we apply Isaiah 28 verse 10 and when we connect various passages together while focusing on searching out patterns provided to us in the Bible. Thirdly, 
Jesus rose from the dead in a glorified body that is described as being capable of operating outside the laws of our dimensionality and having access to additional dimensions in which he could cross boundaries that we cannot cross in our corruptible bodies. This is described in Luke. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. This clearly distinguishes Jesus' resurrection from other resurrection events. In every other historic situation recorded in the word, people were raised from the dead in the same corruptible body, somewhat rejuvenated maybe, but they died again at a later stage. Finally, we read about Jesus' ascension into heaven, which did not form part of any other historic resurrection event that is described to us in the Bible, although there were two people that ascended into heaven without dying, and these were Enoch and Elijah. Another interesting attribute provided to us, forming part of the template, describes to us that Jesus was received into a cloud, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. There are two other events found in the word describing ascension events that also have this property. I will get to this as we continue. When considering these attributes, we find that they assist us to identify specific aspects that are characteristic of the harvest known as the first resurrection. We now have a template based on the model given to us in Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension that will also apply to the rest of the harvest, understanding that the remaining events represent the main harvest and the corners of the field that are left to the poor. I would expect all three events that we are searching for to have similar properties that are provided in the pattern of Jesus' resurrection, as they all form part of the same harvest. The remaining two events will also have some differences, given the differences when we understand the method with which a field should be harvested. The remaining two events will in my opinion also come about as acts of God alone, based on Jesus' resurrection being the first fruits, or being the first instance of a three-part process, in which God changes people from an existence in mortal bodies to an existence in immortal bodies followed by their ascension into heaven, in a cloud I could add. The first fruits comprise the smallest portion of the harvest. The two remaining events will, in my opinion, also involve groups of people that will be raised from the dead through an act of God, but will in both cases include more people than those who were part of the first fruits. In both instances, people should be receiving glorified bodies, with some time having to elapse, to separate the two remaining events. It is also important to understand what happens during a harvest and how this relates to the first resurrection. Before the owner of a field gathers in his main harvest, the poor are not allowed to touch it. Only after the main harvest is gathered in are the poor allowed to start the gleaning process. If they start to glean the field of the owner before the main harvest has occurred, it would be seen as theft. However, as soon as the main harvest is gathered in, the corners are made available to the poor, to do with as they please. This is really important to understand when considering the tribulation, and how the tribulation period is clearly associated with the last part of the harvest, or the corners of the field that are left to the poor. The implications of this will hopefully become even more evident as we continue. So where do we find passages that describe to us parts of what we have seen in Jesus' case? I believe our first candidate descriptions of an event is found in the descriptions that Paul gives to the churches of Corinth and Thessalonica, and this is what we read. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality more information about this event is provided in Paul's letter to Thessalonica for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Paul supplies us with a number of attributes that we can link to Jesus' resurrection. He describes a collective resurrection from the dead, and in this case he identifies two groups of people, those that are alive at the time that this event occurs, and secondly, those who have died in Christ. He mentions the change from an existence in corruptible bodies to incorruptible bodies and he describes people ascending into heaven once again in a cloud when this happens. Identifying specific correlations with what we know about Jesus' resurrection and ascension, we can say with certainty that Paul is describing one of the remaining events that will form part of the first resurrection. There is a difference that we notice in this event when compared to that of Jesus, and this is the fact that we have living people that are part of this group that will not see death, or that would be changed in an instant before ascending with those that were resurrected from the dead into heaven. Another event is described in Revelation 11, in which a resurrection and ascension occur. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and an half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and an half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. There are some aspects of Revelation 11 that correlate to Jesus' resurrection and to that which Paul describes. The two witnesses are murdered by the Antichrist and are resurrected through an act of God after three and a half days, which is another interesting detail provided to us that we have to study carefully to uncover additional information. When I encounter specific detail mentioned in a passage like this, I always think of it as a link to another passage that I have to follow to discover something that was hidden purposefully. When the two witnesses are resurrected, they also ascend into heaven, again, and very specifically, in a cloud. There are no other passages in the Word of God that I know of that describe resurrection and ascension events to us for consideration in forming part of the first resurrection. We know that the pattern of the first resurrection is initiated with the resurrection of Jesus and the Old Testament saints as the first fruits. We are missing some information in both Paul and John's accounts of events, having similar attributes to that of the first fruits that we need to study some more by linking them to other passages and by applying additional patterns in order to understand what differentiates them from the first fruits and with which part of the harvest they can be identified. In my studies of prophecies in the Word of God, 
I have found that when specific events are mentioned in books such as Revelation, we have to approach this with the understanding that we are going to need to rely on information provided to us elsewhere in this incredible book to obtain a clear understanding of what we read. The fact that Revelation 11 mentions to us that the two witnesses were dead in the streets for three and a half days is in my experience a flashing light signaling to me that we have to follow this lead, linking it to a pattern that will clarify some questions we may have and resulting in obtaining a better understanding. I immediately think of the following passage. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In this passage, Jesus prophesied about his own death on the cross, and that he would spend three days and three nights in the grave. He also links this for us to Jonah's time in the belly of the fish. Jesus also stated that the sign of Jonah would be the only sign that would be given to Israel, having desired a sign from God during Jesus' ministry. When we consider Jesus' death, traditionally it is believed that Jesus died on a Friday, because the Bible recorded that he had to be buried before the Sabbath. However, when we read Leviticus 23, we see that the day following the Feast of Passover is another feast day of the Lord, as it is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day of which is always a Sabbath. And the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover, and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein. Given this information, there is then no reason to position Jesus' death on a Friday, since any day that follows the day of Passover is also a Sabbath, as it starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We need to look then at what Jesus said about his time in the grave to position this correctly, given that his grave was found empty on a Sunday morning. Jesus specifically mentions three days and three nights which would indicate to us that these are in fact three 24-hour periods and that these have to be full days. A Friday death and burial does not allow enough time to confirm Jesus' words about his time in the grave as it only gives a little more than a day in the grave. Jesus had to be buried before 6 p.m. which allows for 24 hours up to the beginning of the first day. And we know Jesus' grave was empty when the woman arrived on the morning of the first day, leaving us with Jesus being in the grave for between 36 and 40 hours only, which contradicts what Jesus said. If we keep to what Jesus said without contradicting his words, we have to position his death in such a way that this would allow for at least three days and three nights in the grave, and this would then require the crucifixion to happen on a Wednesday and his death to occur on a Wednesday afternoon. We also know that arrangements had to be made for his body to be buried before the next Sabbath which started at sundown. We know that Jesus died around 3 p.m. on the day of his crucifixion and this adds additional time to the period during which he would be dead in addition to the time that his body would be in the grave. We see this referenced in the following passage. This man went unto Pilate, and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down, and wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a sepulchre that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. We know that Jesus' grave was found empty on a Sunday morning, and that he had not risen from the dead at the end of the preceding Sabbath, or the Saturday, following his crucifixion. This adds additional time to the length of his death, Jesus being dead then for more than three days and three hours at least. This would then seem to match the pattern provided to us in the length of time that the two witnesses were dead, which is specifically given as three and a half days. When we encounter situations where it seems that a pattern repeats, we have to investigate further to see if we can find several correlations between the two instances to firstly confirm the pattern, and secondly, 
to discover what information had been hidden in the pattern for us. However, having only one matching association between Jesus' death and resurrection and that of the two witnesses is not enough to validate or to confirm a repeating pattern in my opinion. So we need to find additional links between Jesus' ministry and that of the two witnesses to confirm that the two witnesses are actually following a pattern set out by Jesus during his ministry. The fact that there is a hint to a correlation between Jesus' death and that of the two witnesses and that of Jonah being in the belly of the whale is a flashing light that tells me there is much more to discover here. Next, considering Jesus' ministry, we find that John writes about three Passover feasts that Jesus attended during his ministry. This would assign a minimum period of three years to his ministry. In addition, Jesus ministered to those who loved him for another 40 days after his resurrection. It is then safe to say that his ministry lasted longer than three years but less than four years, and a three and a half year approximation could be linked to the 1260 days, which is given as the duration of the two witnesses' ministry, if a pattern is confirmed. Next, let us look at the two witnesses' ministry and see what we can learn when referencing the pattern of Jesus' ministry. Based on the timelines that we have discussed up to this point in Daniel's 70th week, we know that the two witnesses' ministry has to start around the time that the Antichrist is revealed, as their deaths are associated with the midpoint of the seven-year period, and their ministry involves witnessing to those who will be beheaded for refusing to accept the mark of the beast. Also, when we consider their association with the seven feast days of the Lord, we find that two witnesses traditionally come forward on the Feast of Trumpets to testify before the Sanhedrin in order to confirm the start of the new year. When we add 1260 days to the Feast of Trumpets, it takes us to the Spring Feasts, three and a half years later, that would coincide with the end of their ministry, and given the pattern presented to us in Jesus' death and resurrection, we should check to see whether a Passover death and first fruits resurrection is once again followed. To test this assumption, we have to look a little closer at the timing of events that occur at the midpoint of the seven year period, and the clues left for us by our Heavenly Father to tie this all together. I believe we find an important clue in the following passage describing the ministry of the two witnesses to us. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people, and kindreds, and tongues, and nations, shall see their dead bodies three days and an half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and an half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. 
The two witnesses' resurrection is clearly associated with an earthquake in which the remnant that will be fleeing Judea is also mentioned. We need to note that the remnant is only formed and identified once they obey the warning that Jesus gave in Matthew 24. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. We know from the information discussed in previous videos that the earthquake that occurs during the remnant's flight into the wilderness is the one that splits the crust of the earth and separates the Mount of Olives into two parts. This crack that forms is also called the mouth of the earth that opens in Revelation 12, swallowing the flood of water from which the remnant will be saved. The final verse of this passage in Revelation tells us that the two witnesses are resurrected and ascend into heaven in the same hour that the Mount of Olives is split into two parts, and also the same hour at which the remnant's protection in the wilderness begins. Applying some logic to this then, if the two witnesses are resurrected in the same hour as the earthquake that splits the Mount of Olives, we know that they are murdered three and a half days earlier. The remnant will then have exactly three and a half days to get out of Judea after they see the two witnesses being murdered by the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation being set up in the Temple of God. You may be asking, why is this important? When we deal with prophecy, we deal with patterns and we need to understand how to apply information from patterns given to us in the Word of God to obtain a better understanding of events where we lack detail. And you will soon see what I mean by this. Looking at the passage in Revelation 11, we now have another connection to events at the midpoint that are modeled after a pattern that we are familiar with, and this involves the escape of the remnant from Judea. This event is clearly connected to Israel's escape from Egypt, described to us in the book of Exodus. When it comes to the timing of Israel's escape from Egypt, the book of Exodus clearly explains to us when this occurs, and this, just as Jesus' crucifixion, happened on the day of Passover. Can you see how the day of Passover is coming into the spotlight when we consider the events that are linked to patterns demonstrated in historic events? Israel's escape from Egypt is described in the following three passages. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand and ye shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. When Israel fled Egypt, they arrived at the Red Sea a number of days later, and were supernaturally protected in the crevice that formed in the waters of the Red Sea, having two walls of water on each side. The Egyptians that followed died in this flood of water when the Red Sea closed in on them. This pattern repeats again in the book of Revelation, when we study the events carefully. In Revelation's case, it is the earth that forms a crevice to swallow the flood of water, and in so doing, helping Israel to escape. We already know that the remnant will escape Judea when the two witnesses are murdered, as this will represent the sign that will be given to Israel, to know that their time to flee has come. Given the remnant's escape from Judea, matching Israel's situation during their exodus from Egypt, we know that the remnant will also flee Judea on the day of Passover. This is further confirmed to us in the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he ended the requirement for sacrifices to be made in the temple. Daniel 9 tells us that the Antichrist will stop the sacrifices and the oblations that would have resumed with the third temple in place at the midpoint of this week. Referring to the pattern given in Jesus' death, we know on which day this happened. It happens once again on the day of Passover. 
This will also be the day on which the abomination will be set up in the holy place of the temple by the Antichrist. When the two witnesses' bodies are seen on the streets of Jerusalem, the city is suddenly associated with Sodom and Egypt, both of which are linked to people fleeing from them before great destruction followed. It is amazing to realize then that based on the pattern that is associated with the remnant's flight out of Judea, clearly occurring on the day of Passover, and matching the events that occurred in Exodus, that the two witnesses are indeed also murdered on the day of Passover, matching the pattern of Jesus' death and ending the sacrificial system once again. They are also resurrected three and a half days later exactly in the same pattern that we saw followed during Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Their deaths are also associated with Jonah being in the belly of the fish for three and a half days which is the only sign given to Israel and based on this sign and Israel receiving understanding of its meaning by this time, the remnant will be fleeing Judea. The earthquake that links the two witnesses' resurrection to the remnant's flight into the wilderness occurs three and a half days after the remnant received their signal to flee. What is then even more interesting to realize, given that the two witnesses are resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits, is that this event not only completes the first resurrection, but it also initiates the next harvest that is known as the second resurrection. The following passage links the resurrection of the two witnesses to the first fruits of the next harvest, as well as the return of Jesus to establish and take possession of his kingdom on earth. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Note how the 144,000 are called the first fruits of them that have been redeemed from among men, and not, as in Jesus' case, the first of them that slept. The fact that these men from the twelve tribes of Israel are called the first fruits indicate that they are not part of the harvest that was sanctified by Jesus, who represented the first fruits of that specific harvest. The 144,000, in fact, form part of a different harvest, as they are the first fruits of this new harvest or field. I believe then that to understand this correctly, we have to look at the crops that are harvested in Israel. I am of the opinion that Jesus and those who form part of the harvest that he sanctified are represented by the barley harvest, which historically was the first of the crops to be harvested. This is then followed by the wheat harvest, and I am of the opinion that the 144,000 represents the first fruits of the wheat harvest. One characteristic that is clearly associated with the barley harvest is having faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and having the Spirit of God indwelling those that will become part of the body of Christ, specifically before his return to earth at the start of his millennial reign. A characteristic that I see associated with the wheat harvest is the complete absence of faith, confirmed to us in the following passage. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I have always wondered how the description given to us about the 144,000 is associated with the remnant that flees from Judea into the wilderness, as there are some obvious problems in reconciling the two entities if one assumes that they are one and the same. 
Some of the characteristics associated with the 144,000 are clearly distinguishing them from those that will flee Judea. The 144,000 are all described as male virgins from the physical tribes of Israel, having no guile while those who flee into the wilderness have houses and possessions, which would allow them ample time for deception and lies to be part of their lives. When we understand the harvest cycle that is applied, and that the 144,000 are in fact resurrected as the first fruits of the second harvest, we can easily see how the 144,000 and the remnant are related. Based on the description of the 144,000, the only logical way to have so many male virgins who have never said anything deceptive in their lives and who have not been defiled by women would be to understand that the 144,000 are all infants, not yet capable of deception or speech for that matter. We know then of two events where mass executions of children two years and younger matching this description have occurred and this was in Egypt when Pharaoh instructed all Hebrew boys under the age of two to be murdered and secondly in Israel when King Herod gave the same instruction in an attempt to kill Jesus when he was a baby. It is also interesting to see that those who form part of the 144,000 are all exclusively of Hebrew descent, or part of Israel, and that there are no Gentiles included in this group or this harvest. When we consider the harvest pattern, we know then that this harvest, also consisting of three parts, with the first fruits described to us in detail, will have the same attributes as that of the first fruits. The remnant that flees from Judea will just as the 144,000 belong to the 12 tribes of Israel and represents the second and largest part of this harvest. These people from the 12 tribes of Israel who are protected through the tribulation will repopulate the earth during the millennium and their harvest event will occur at the end of the millennium once again leaving the corners of the field to the poor. This explains another passage in Revelation 12 to us which is often confusing without having this insight into the harvest pattern. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. When the woman escapes the flood and receives God's protection in the wilderness for three and a half years, we know that it is only the remnant that remains on the earth having God's image in their DNA. Those from the Gentile nations will all have been beheaded for refusing the mark of the beast or will be worshipping the Antichrist having accepted his mark. The remnant that is referred to in this passage therefore cannot be part of the barley harvest and neither can it be part of the first or second part of the wheat harvest as Satan is bound for a thousand years and released from his prison right at the end of the millennium for another three and a half years. This is the only time during which Satan can make war with the remnant of the seed of the woman, and this will once again be the corners of the wheat harvest that will be picked off at the end of the millennium, just as the tribulation represents the corners of the barley harvest that are picked off by the Antichrist. Understanding that Israel represents the wheat harvest that comes after the barley harvest and whose first fruits are presented to the Lord when he returns to set up his kingdom on earth, we begin to uncover more detail about the situation of the remnant and the future of this harvest when we consider the following passage. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. 
Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This passage describes to us the contamination of the wheat harvest by the enemy sowing tares. I believe that as we are specifically dealing with the wheat harvest in this parable, and we understand from the information considered up to this point that the wheat harvest represents those belonging to the nation of Israel during the millennium, we begin to understand how the tares are sown into this harvest when we consider Israel's condition at this point in time. Based on the pattern provided to us in Israel's flight from Egypt in Exodus, we know that Israel's situation at the midpoint of the seven year period will be similar to their situation in Egypt just before they fled during the Exodus. They will be slaves, this time in their own country, and their masters will be exceptionally cruel. I believe that some of the situations that those who belong to the nation of Israel will have to endure during this time are described to us in the following passages. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Servants have ruled over us. There is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. We get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. They ravished the women in Zion and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hanged up by their hand. The faces of elders were not honored. They took the young men to grind, and the children fell under the wood. The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men from their music. The joy of our heart has ceased. Our dance is turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people and they shall say, The Lord is my God. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Remember that these passages describe Israel's situation during the three and a half years following the start of the tribulation. This ends at the midpoint when those who are left in Judea flee and receive protection from God for 1260 days. Israel will experience terrible hardship during this time under the reign of the Antichrist and the women specifically will be abused and raped by those who serve the Antichrist. The servants of the Antichrist will be those who have accepted his mark. At the point when the remnant is about to flee Judea there will be women that will either be pregnant with children or nursing children that came about as a result of their abuse. And I believe that these are the tares that will grow up with the harvest until the end when the wheat and the tares will be harvested together. This, once again, shows us that there would be a repeat situation in which the serpent will be attempting to corrupt the image of God by contaminating the DNA of those who are created in the image of God. The same situation led to God destroying the earth with water during the days of Noah, and will again happen during the time of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will require every person made in the image of God to accept a change to their DNA that would remove their humanity and their eligibility for salvation. 
Those who refuse will suffer death through beheading. This will also be the reason why God will destroy the earth with fire when he pours out his wrath over the Antichrist and those who follow him. I believe Jesus refers to these women in Matthew 24 who will be pregnant or nursing as a result of being rape victims of those who have accepted the mark of the beast resulting in hybrid beings known as the tares that are sown into the wheat harvest. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. At the end of the millennium, Satan is released for a little season, or three and a half years, to deceive those that are alive at this point in time. We know that a little season is associated with three and a half years, based on this specific term being used twice in relation to those who are waiting under the altar for their resurrection, and the time for which Satan would be released out of prison. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. I am of the opinion that Daniel's 70th week is in fact split into two parts, and that the week that had been determined over Israel specifically, only comes into effect when the remnant enters their protection in the wilderness. This time initiates when God takes Israel back under his wings and protects them from any harm, which does not happen yet during the reign of the Antichrist. Israel's protection lasts for three and a half years, leaving us with another little season, or three and a half years, at the end of the millennium during which Satan will be released from prison to deceive the world again. Understanding the pattern of the harvest and that the millennium will have only descendants from the nation of Israel living on the earth as mortals and forming part of this harvest, even though they will be tares as part of this group, we understand that God cannot be finished with Israel until the entire wheat harvest is reaped. We would therefore need to reconsider the positioning of timing given to Daniel by Gabriel in the following passage. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Sin does not come to an end until the end of the millennium, as we know that there is a final and sinful rebellion at this point during which Satan will once again deceive the mortals and get them to rebel against God. I believe this will be accomplished through those who are known as the tares. As such, Gabriel's prophecy cannot be fulfilled until after this final rebellion which only occurs at the end of the millennium. As Revelation 6 provides us with a definition to understand the duration of a little season, and we know that Israel is protected for this period of time in the wilderness, we know that the period during which Satan will once again deceive those who are alive at the end of the millennium will also be 1260 days. We have then two bookends encapsulating Israel's harvest where God protects those that will repopulate the millennium at the start of this period and the other at the end of this harvest and as such the week that Gabriel referred to in the book of Daniel. If we assume that Daniel's 70th week ends at the start of the millennial reign of Christ we contradict the word of God in saying that there will be no sin on earth during the millennium which is clearly false. Going back to comparing the ministry of the two witnesses to that of Jesus, we find another interesting aspect of the two witnesses ministry that is often overlooked. This is the power that the two witnesses are given to destroy those who come against them during their ministry. This power is described as fire coming from their mouths, devouring their enemies that come against them. 
and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Nowhere in the word does it state that this power would be taken from them, but in the next verse we see that they can use their power at their own will, and this gives us great insight into their deaths. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who are those that would be their enemies? I would say that these would be the Antichrist and those who follow him, those having the mark of the beast. When the two witnesses have finished their testimony, we read that the beast overcomes them and kill them. So how is it possible that the beast is able to overcome the two witnesses at the end of their ministry, but not able to kill them before this point in time? Surely, if the beast is able to kill the two witnesses at the end of their ministry, he should also be able to kill them at the start of their ministry. But this does not happen. How do we understand this correctly? Once again, we find the answer in the pattern provided to us when evaluating the ministry of Jesus. He, who created the heavens and the earth, willingly chose not to defend himself at the end of his ministry in order to save us from eternal damnation. The Bible describes to us an event where those who wanted to put him to death before the end of his ministry were unable to do so, as we can see in the following passage. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. Jesus did not allow those who wanted to kill him to do so before his ministry was complete. As the creator of the universe, he had the power to take up his own life after he died. And if he chose to, he could have saved himself from the cross too. But he loved us more than his own life and offered his life willingly in exchange to redeem and sanctify those who would believe in him. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The same attitude that we see in Jesus is found in the two witnesses, as described in the last sentence of the following passage. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. The only logical way in which the beast is then able to overcome the two witnesses, considering the information in the previous passages, is to understand that the two witnesses will lay down their lives willingly to be put to death once they have completed their mission, just as Jesus did. I believe it is clear to see that they will follow the pattern given to us by Jesus and choose not to use the power given to them to kill their enemies when their ministry is complete. In other words, they will not love their lives unto death. 
When Jesus hung on the cross, he spoke the following words just before he died, completing his mission. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What did Jesus finish and what was Jesus' mission? I believe the Bible tells us that it was to reconcile humanity with God and to remove the wall of sin that existed between us and to set us free from the bondage of sin. The Bible continues to explain to us what Jesus did once he died and this is given to us in two passages written by Peter. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. For, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. The purpose of Jesus preaching to those who were called spirits in prison during the time while he was dead is given to us in the same passage and this was to bring them to God and we know that these people that Jesus brought with him to God are described as the first fruits. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. If these people rose with Jesus from the dead, they are part of the first fruits, and the scripture tells us that Jesus brought them to God. This means that they are part of the harvest, which is referred to as the first resurrection, and that the same attributes that apply to Jesus during this event would also have applied to them. Those who rose with Jesus from the dead, who are part of the first fruits, had to have received incorruptible bodies just as Jesus did, and had to have ascended into heaven with Jesus in order for him to present them to God as the first fruits of the harvest. Also note that this presentation of the first fruits before God occurred before Jesus' ascension into heaven forty days later. I base this on the fact that Jesus said to Mary not to touch him right after his resurrection, and that he took the Old Testament saints with him to heaven between speaking with Mary and appearing to his disciples a little later. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. When Jesus then appeared to his disciples, he already presented himself with the Old Testament saints before God, as he invites his disciples to handle him, where Mary was told not to touch him, as he still had to present the first fruits to the Father at that point. These aspects are not specifically mentioned in the Gospels, and our Heavenly Father requires us to consider all of his word to discover these facts. I find it amazing how our Heavenly Father never leaves out necessary detail to confirm His word to us and to give us better insight into a matter when we follow His instructions on how to read His word. So who were these people that rose with Jesus from the dead and ascended with Him into heaven? I believe we find the answer in Hebrews 11 and Revelation 4. This is what we read. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, 
and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This passage describes the Old Testament saints who obtained a good report based on their faith. Note that nothing is mentioned here about their ability to keep or perform the works of the law, and some lived in times where the law was not even given yet. Hebrews 11 continues to describe at least 18 identifiable Old Testament saints, with some general references being made to the prophets. What is even more amazing to discover is that these people are referred to as the elders. Based on what we understand then, these people being part of the first fruits have already received their glorified bodies and have ascended with Jesus to heaven shortly after his resurrection when Jesus took them to the Father. This could only happen after Jesus removed the wall of sin that separated them from God and this is then confirmed to us in Revelation 4 where John describes them to us. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. When we understand the harvest, it is so obvious that the elders that are described by John and seen before the throne of God are those that are described in Hebrews 11, where they are specifically referred to as the elders. They were resurrected with Jesus from the dead as part of the first fruits of the harvest because of their faith. We also see that it is only John that sees them in the throne room and neither Isaiah nor Ezekiel, which were also allowed access to the throne room of God, made any mention of them. This tells us that they arrived in heaven after Isaiah and Ezekiel's time and before John wrote the revelation that he received from Jesus. In most teachings I have heard about the subject where the elders are mentioned, people attempt to understand what the 24 elders represent by symbolizing them instead of trying to understand who they are, which becomes very obvious when we apply Isaiah 28 verse 10 and divide the word of God correctly. Coming back to the two witnesses and how they compare in this instance to Jesus, we see in Revelation a specific group of people described that are seen under the altar of God. They are described in two passages in Revelation that we have to combine to obtain a complete understanding. The first is found in Revelation 6. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. This passage describes people that are assembling under the altar of God, being slain for the word of God, having to remain under the altar until a specific condition is met. This immediately connects this passage to the pattern of the Old Testament saints that were kept in prison as a result of sin that separated them from God. Until Jesus could deal with their sin and share the good news with them, they could not escape their prison. Revelation 6 explains that those under the altar are slain for the word of God and for the testimony that they held. But it does not tell us what their testimony is or why they have to wait under the altar until their fellow servants have been slain as they were. This detail is provided to us in Revelation 20. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, 
and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 20 supplies the missing detail. We see that those who arrive under the altar of God are all beheaded for refusing to accept the mark of the beast and for refusing to worship the Antichrist. We are also shown that they all have the testimony of Jesus Christ. One interesting aspect to take note of is that the corners of the field that are left to the poor are specifically forbidden to be harvested by the owner of the field. How would this group then be treated, considering that the owner is not allowed to harvest this portion in the same manner as he did in the case of the first fruits and that of the main harvest? The only option I can think of in which the corners of the field would be brought into the barn of the owner would be for the owner to redeem it. When I was investigating this, our Heavenly Father pointed me to a specific passage in Leviticus to understand what happens in this situation, specifically to those who have already been sanctified that the owner wants to redeem. I believe we find the answer in Leviticus 27 when we combine it with what is written in Romans 11. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Jesus was sinless while he was living in a mortal body on earth and was the first of those who would be resurrected from the dead. Through his self-sacrificing act on the cross, he sanctified the rest of the harvest as explained in Romans 11. Given then that the rest of the harvest is sanctified by the first fruits, we understand that the corners of the field are also holy unto God, and we have to take into account what is written in Leviticus to understand the situation better. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. This ordinance given in Leviticus tells us that it is not possible for the corners of the field to be redeemed by the owner of the field, as these have been devoted to the Lord already. Given then that the corners of the field are not allowed to be harvested by the owner, and that he cannot redeem this portion of the harvest either, the instruction given in Leviticus states that if this condition exists, where men are involved, that they have to be put to death. We see the final part of this harvest, or the corners of the field, then clearly connected to those who are beheaded for the testimony of Jesus as described in the passage from Revelation 20. These people have been sanctified by Jesus, who is the first of the first fruits, and they did not form part of the two groups that were harvested by the owner of the field. Based on the instructions given then in Leviticus 27, these have to be put to death as they are holy to God. The completion of this process is then described to us in Revelation 20. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Scripture shows us that those under the altar are awaiting the resurrection event being released from their prison under the altar to being positioned on thrones and ruling with Jesus for a thousand years. 
Once again, we do not see the other two parts of this harvest mentioned in this passage. But when we put everything together that we have considered up to this point, we know that the resurrection of those under the altar completes the first resurrection, and that they represent the final part of this harvest, or the corners of the field that have to be put to death. The same situation will once again occur during the wheat harvest, where those who have been sanctified by the 144,000, who are the first fruits of the wheat harvest, will have to be put to death. At this point, I think you will agree with me that there are several connections that we can clearly identify between the ministry of Jesus and that of the two witnesses. As such, I believe we can fully rely on a repeating instance that will allow us to exchange information between the two events to obtain a better understanding of each. Following the pattern of Jesus' ministry, we discover then when those under the altar of God will be resurrected. Their resurrection coincides with that of the two witnesses, as this is the last of the three resurrection events that are mentioned. In both Jesus and the two witnesses situations, we have people who are in prison that are set free as a result of those who have preached to them, and who were obedient unto God in laying down their lives willingly at the end of their ministries. In both instances, we see that Jesus and the two witnesses had power over their enemies, preventing them from killing them until their ministry completed. We also know based on this pattern that when the two witnesses are murdered, there remains nobody eligible to become part of the body of Christ or the first resurrection after this point, as this is the final part of this three-part harvest. This still leaves us with Paul's description of an event that will include two groups of people that are distinctly different to the events associated with the resurrection of Jesus and the two witnesses. Here are some of the obvious differences. Paul mentions people that are alive at the time when this event that he is describing will occur, while those who end up under the altar of God are all beheaded for refusing the mark of the beast. This leaves no room for anybody who is alive to become part of the corners of the field that will be resurrected. Based on the instructions given in Leviticus 27, those who become part of this final group all have to be put to death, and therefore Paul's description cannot be associated with the resurrection of those who are beheaded for refusing the mark of the beast. Secondly, Paul describes an event that occurs suddenly and unexpectedly. While those under the altar of God assemble in this location over a period of time known as a little season, or three and a half years, as they wait for their fellow servants to be slain as they were. Similar to Jesus' ministry, the death of the two witnesses marks, in my opinion, the completion of the requirement that is preventing those who are separated from God to be united with Him. In Jesus' case, the first fruits could not be presented to God until Jesus removed the wall of sin that stood between man and God. In the two witnesses' case, those under the altar cannot be resurrected until the last person is beheaded for receiving the testimony of Jesus, which would position the two witnesses then as the last two people on earth who would lay down their lives willingly after completing their mission ensuring that those that have been sanctified by the Lord have received the testimony of Jesus and have been put to death. I believe the two witnesses fulfill their mission when they lay down their lives willingly to be put to death, just as Jesus did when he laid down his life willingly to sanctify those who would believe in him as their Savior. Paul describes people who are said to be in Christ and meeting him in the clouds and being with Christ from that point forward. This is not the case with those who arrive under the altar of God. These are not said to be in Christ, but they are still separated from God at this point, having to wait under the altar and are described as continually crying out to the Lord to avenge their deaths. This situation is described in a parable that provides another clue that we will discuss in the next video. And shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily.
Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? So when does Paul's resurrection event occur? This event clearly follows after the first fruits and clearly describes the main harvest associated with the first resurrection. This resurrection event includes every born again believer whether they are currently dead or still alive at the time when this event occurs. Those who are alive will be expecting the return of their Savior before the tribulation starts and will be doing what Jesus instructed those who want to escape the hardship of the tribulation and that is to watch for His coming and to pray continuously. Those who form part of this harvest are indwelt by the Holy Spirit covering the time from the point where Jesus rose from the dead up to the point where this harvest occurs and will be the greatest of the three events. This harvest has as a result the corners of the field being left to the poor. Understanding the harvest model given to Israel also assists our understanding of the restraining force that Paul writes about in his letter to Thessalonica. The poor cannot begin their gleaning until the main harvest has occurred. If they took from the field while the main harvest has not occurred, it requires restitution. If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten, and shall put in his beast, and shall feed in another man's field, of the best of his own field, and of the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. It is clear to see then that the main harvest is connected to the restrainer mentioned by Paul. Those who are part of the main harvest will be expecting and looking forward to the return of their Savior to remove them from this world as promised in the Bible. This is confirmed in a passage from Luke that is specifically written for those who will form part of this group that will include people that are alive when they are changed into an everlasting life with Jesus in glorified bodies. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Another passage relating to this event is given to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, describing the comfort that is associated with this resurrection and ascension. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. This passage by Paul clearly excludes the corners of the field, as they all have to be put to death. And this does not describe the comfort that Paul mentions in his letter to Thessalonica or the blessed hope that Paul mentions in his letter to Titus in Titus chapter 2. The Bible also tells us that those who will be part of the corners of the field will not be ready when the Lord returns and will believe that their master is a hard man that will delay his coming. I believe that even though these people might be saved, they will be left behind and will have to submit themselves to beheading and to wait then for a little season under the altar of God until all their fellow servants who form part of the corners of the field have been slain as they were. When we understand this, we also realize that the covenant that the Antichrist will make with many cannot be a peace agreement as many often teach, but that it is in fact the mark of the beast system that will be effected almost as soon as the Antichrist is revealed. I say this because we know that the two witnesses ministry starts at the time when the Antichrist is revealed, or at the point where the tribulation commences, and those to whom they testify will be beheaded for refusing to take the mark of the beast. This process ends after three and a half years when the two witnesses lay down their lives as the last remaining people on earth having the image of God in their DNA, outside of the remnant of Israel. The concept that most have adopted regarding the covenant that the Antichrist will make with many is that the Antichrist will establish a peace agreement and that he would then end this agreement after three and a half years. 
But this is reading into the text what is clearly not written there. The Word of God states that the Antichrist will make an end to the sacrifices and oblations after three and a half years, and nothing about breaking his covenant. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Given the fact that people will not be forced to accept the mark of the beast, shows us that a covenant has been established. This will be a contractual agreement stipulating that the mark of the beast will not be forcefully given to people who refuse it, and that it has to be accepted willingly. The alternative, however, for refusing to accept the mark of the beast will be beheading, and this will be enforced. In conclusion, I would like to show you how the different views of the rapture are all connected to the events that we have discussed today, which essentially boils down to two remaining resurrection and ascension events that are modeled after that which occurred when Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven. I think you will agree that it is very obvious that the resurrection event that Paul is describing matches an event that happens before but also leading into the tribulation period. This is preventing the Antichrist from stepping forward and requires these people to be removed before he can receive authority over those who may not be harvested by God himself, but who have to be put to death according to God's instructions in Leviticus. Just as the poor are not allowed to harvest the owner's field before the corners of the field are left to them, Satan is not allowed access to the corners of the field until the main harvest has occurred. This main harvest is known as the pre-tribulation rapture, as this is also the only instance in the three-part series known as the first resurrection in which people who are alive on earth will receive glorified bodies while they are alive, and taken up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and to be with Him immediately. They will also continue with Him forever and won't have to wait under the altar for their deaths to be avenged. Those who believe in a mid-tribulation event understand that there will be a resurrection event three and a half years after the tribulation started but they do not realize that there is a preceding resurrection event that initiates the tribulation. This is very similar to those who believe in the pre-wrath event which occurs before the Lord returns to pour out His wrath over the wicked. Those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture understand that there is a resurrection event when the Lord returns to the earth, but they do not understand the timeline associated with this period correctly or that there is another resurrection event occurring at the beginning of the tribulation. They also have the wrong impression of our Heavenly Father's character and do not understand that God does not pour His wrath out over those that belong to Him. I believe that when we understand how we should apply the pattern of the harvest given to us in the Word of God, these mysteries and differences in opinion are easily resolved and we understand why people are associating their beliefs with one of the two remaining events, based on specific parts of the Word of God they choose to consider while excluding others. So when it comes to the rapture, I agree with those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, which is also where I position myself. But I also fully agree with those who believe in the other three views, as they are clearly supported by God's Word, the question is just, where in this harvest do you want to position yourself, as God has given us a choice and has told us what to do to be found worthy to form part of the group that will be harvested by Him, and who will be with Him immediately? But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. 
I hope that this information was useful to you and that it will bless you as you consider this. In the next video, we will look at specific points mentioned earlier to further elaborate on this complex subject, but we will also specifically focus on how the body of Christ is modeled after the temple of God, matching the harvest pattern that we have discussed today. I think it is abundantly clear to see that the two witnesses ministry follows the same pattern as that of Jesus, as we have uncovered more than seven aspects in which we find perfectly matching correlations. We can therefore exchange information between the two instances to learn more about the other where information is missing, using this repeating pattern. I hope that you will now have a better understanding of how to interpret the first resurrection, and how this can be understood perfectly by applying the models and patterns provided to us in the Word of God. There is so much depth in this amazing book, and I want to encourage you to study these subjects for yourself, and ask the Holy Spirit to open the Word of God to you and to give you understanding. Thank you so much for watching. If you have not done so, please would you consider subscribing and giving the video a like. It will help to improve its visibility and allow more people to access this information in the little time that remains. You are also welcome to copies of two ebooks that I have made available that you can find in the links in the description below. Until next time, God bless.